Um, all right, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so the rundown for today is we'll have um, a rest lecture, a GIT lecture from 10 to 12, then we'll have lunch in the foyer. And then after that, we'll have endocrine and renal from one to three. Um, the slides are on the event, so if you go onto the event tomorrow, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you go onto the event, the first link is the Google Docs with all the slides. Um, yeah. Good. Thank you. Hi. Uh, can everyone hear me? So my name is Bakani. I'm one of the third years at Cabrini. So I'm uh, going to try and go through rest in an hour, which is going to be a bit of an impossible task. Um, I tried to make the slides as comprehensive as possible so that you can refer to them back later. And there's some questions at the end, which if we get a chance to go through, we'll go through, but there's answers there. Feel free to ask questions along the way as we go. Um, so I'll talk a bit about anatomy and histology and then go through some physiology a little bit about microbiology, which is not very important. And there are some farms. Um, so we might keep going. Um, so just basic anatomy of the thoracic cage. Um, so you have 12 ribs, as I think we all know. And one rib one to seven are your true ribs and 8 to 12 are your false ribs, and your floating ribs, 11 and 12. So um, rib 1 and 7 are called uh, true, true ribs because they all have individual costal uh, cartilage that articulates with the sternum, whereas the other ribs uh, from 8 to 10 join onto 7 and articulate with the sternum, and 12 are float, 11 and 12 are floating ribs. And as you, they articulate with the vertebra posteriorly. So this is just information about like your atypical ribs and your typical ribs. Um, so your typical ribs are three to nine. They all have a similar structure. They have a head, they have a neck, and they have a tubercle. And then you have like your articular tubercles and your costal grooves and everything. Whereas your atypical ribs, they all are different. So that's 1, 2, 10, 11, and 12. Um, do you guys want me to go through like what are the different things that are part of all the atypical ribs or can you read that yourself at your own time? Move on? Cool. And then the next part is your sternum. So your sternum is kind of like where everything comes together and it has three parts as you might know. So there's the manubrium of the sternum at the top and then you have your body and your xiphoid. And then your sternal angle, where your manubrium and the body comes together, that's what forms your, um, uh, what's it called, sternal, the angle of, I uh, can't remember the name. That's the one where you have your thoracic plane, your, at T4, the T4, T5 level. Angle of blue, yep, I have it over there. Cool. And then your thoracic vertebrae, so you have tall thoracic vertebrae. And um, this is how they look. They kind of have a heart-shaped body. And uh, they have long spinous processes and narrow vertebral foramen. Um, this is because if you look at like the cervical vertebrae, they have quite a big uh, vertebral foramen because you have the cervical plexus. And then when you go lower to the body, you have also a bigger cervical, uh, I mean, uh, foramen also for the lumbar plexus because you have limbs, which you have to move. but in the thorax, you don't have any limbs, that, and you don't need a big spinal cord. That is why. Um, I think that's about it. And they also have articular facets for the um, ribs. So usually one rib, I mean, one vertebra will articulate with two ribs uh, with articular facets above and below. And with your chest wall, you have some chest wall deformity. So I kind of had trouble at the start trying to figure out like which one is pectus excavatum and which one is pectus carinatum. So if you think about an excavator, so that's where you have like a, a sort of a depression in your chest wall. And then the other one is carinatum, which is kind of like the opposite. And then you can have like barrel chest, which you commonly get in obstructive lung diseases. And you have scoliosis, which is like deviation of your um, spine. And kyphosis is just abnormal bending of your, of your uh, vertebrae. 
And I just thought I should touch on about this. This is when you get like a rib fracture. So you get three three rib fractures, and then you get a disconnection between your thoracic wall and your lungs. So what happens is when you breathe in, um, instead of your chest uh, moving, instead of your chest expanding, moves in because of the pressure dip. So it's like you, you inhale in, and then your chest moves inside instead of outside because it's disconnected. So that happens when you have three or more uh, fractured ribs, and you get part of, part of paradoxical chest wall motion. Does that all make sense? Is that all clear? Shall we keep going? And then with your thoracic uh, wall, you have your superior thoracic aperture and your inferior thoracic aperture. So this is your thoracic inlet, um, and it's bordered by all these. So your T1 at the back, and then your first rib, and then um, anteriorly by your manubrium of your sternum, and then the inferior aperture, yep, by all this. Skip. So mediastinum, I think I guess the most important thing is kind of know like what which part of the mediastinum different components are. So you have like your superior mediastinum, which um, remember the angle of Louis, so that's what separates the superior sternum. So everything above that is the superior sternum. And then you have the inferior sternum which has three different divisions. You have the anterior, posterior, and middle mediastinum. And middle is where you have your pericardium. And these are all the contents in there, which we don't have to go through. Yeah, a lot of people last year tried to re, uh, like emphasize on us remembering what red plant is, but we didn't never really got a question on this. But if you have time, yeah, remember it, it, red plant. So that's everything that happens at your sternal angle, so at the uh, transthoracic plane. So you have rib two, the arch of the iota, your trachea bifurcates, pulmonary trunk, you have your ligamentum arteriosum, azygous vein drains into the superior vena cava, and then you have some nerves and the thoracic duct. So just write this down and then try and remember what it is. So now we'll go on to like the different muscles on the thoracic, that form the thoracic wall. So you have your diaphragm. So a diaphragm is a dome-shaped uh, muscle. It has two parts, there's the left and the right side. And like these are all the origins and everything. I don't know how important this is, but I mean, if you have time, you can read through it. But this is what's important. So it's your key muscle for for respiration. So when your diaphragm contracts, that's during inspiration. So it contracts and flattens. And then during expiration, expiration is, I think, you probably know, is a passive movement. Uh, so the diaphragm just relaxes and then moves up. And uh, it's innervated by your thoracic. It's innervated by the phrenic nerve, so C3 to 5. So that's the motor innervation. And we'll talk about. Uh, it also separates your thoracic cavity from your abdominal cavity. So you have some apertures in the diaphragm. So you have the aortic hiatus and the esophageal hiatus and caval hiatus. So the way to remember this is, so your aortic hiatus is from T12 and then everything going up there just uh, subtract two. So T12, T10, T8, and there's some other stuff that pass through with all these other things. Uh, so, uh, Somatic innervation of the diaphragm, so for your sensory pain. So the central part of the diaphragm is innervated by the phrenic nerve. So pain on the central aspect of the diaphragm will radiate to your shoulder tips, whereas the peripheral parts of your diaphragm are innervated by the intercostal nerve. So this will go around your flank regions. Any questions so far? Anything that's not clear? And then you also have your external intercostal muscles, which you usually use for force inspiration. So um, if you trying to figure out how this works, so in external intercostal, think about it. If you have a jacket over top, you put your arms that way. So that, those are your external intercostal muscles. And then your internal is the other way around. So the other way around. Or you can remember the technical terms, inferior anterior or inferior posterior. And then you also have your innermost uh, in the most intercostal muscles, which, yeah, are there. Um, and between your innermost and internal, you have your neurovascular bundle. So there's the main neurovascular bundle, which runs in the costal group, which is uh, on the inferior aspect of your ribs. And then you have a collateral bundle, which runs on the superior aspect. So that's why when you're trying to give 
when you're trying to put a needle in, that's why they always say do it above the rib below so that you can avoid this bundle. We don't really care much about this one because there's, yeah, not much going on there. And then you have all these other muscles which uh, you can learn about. I don't, yeah, not that important. And then uh, now we'll talk about the pleura. So your pleura is a serous membrane which has two layers. So one of the layers is attached to the lung directly, which is your visceral pleura, and then your parietal pleura is on the outer side, which kind of lines the thoracic uh, cavity. And then, so it's a serous membrane, which means that it produces serous fluid. So you have about 10 to 20 milliliters of pleural fluid uh, between your two layers, and this just allows for movement between the two layers so that your lungs can um, move in and out without any friction. And they're both continuous at the pulmonary ligament, which is just around the hilum of the lung. And with the pleura, so you have diff different parts of your, the pleura. There's the cervical pleura at the top, and the costal pleura, and then the diaphragmatic pleura, and the mediastinal. And this is kind of important because they all receive different innovations. So pleuritic pain at different, like pain at different regions will radiate to different sides, which I think, yeah, this is. Yeah, so your visceral pleura is, yeah, you don't really have sharp, that sharp, stabbing, localized pain. It's just uh, dull and diffuse. Whereas your parietal pleura, like I said, it has four parts. So the cervical part is innervated by your T1 dermatome, which is your intercostal nerves. And then uh, the costal part is also by your uh, intercostal nerves, which is T2 to T T2 to T6. Your mediastinal phrenic nerve, so that's also kind of similar to the diaphragm, C3, 4, and 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. And then your diaphragmatic central part, like I said, central diaphragm, phrenic nerve, peripheral part, intercostal nerve. And pleuritic chest pain is sharp, localized, and usually worst on inspiration and relief by leaning forward. Um, just some other stuff about the pleura. So, there's regions of the pleura that are not well protected. So your apices here, they, are, they protrude beyond the uh, bony part of your thoracic wall. So which means that like a, any traumatic injury here, penetrating injury will likely perforate the pleura. And then you also have that on your cystinal area and at the back here. Every other part is kind of protected by the thoracic wall and the musculature. Any questions so far? No. And then lungs, you have, will have two lungs. Yeah. Some people might have less for different reasons. Um, so the right lung has three lobes, left lung has two lobes. And that's because of the heart. There's the heart on the left side of the, of the body. And uh, yeah, important thing about the right lung is that so your main bron bronchus of the right lung is wider, it's shorter, and it's more vertical. So if you aspirate anything, it's likely to go to your right lung. That's kind of important to remember. You might get a question on like, patient is supine in hospital, they aspirate, where would you likely find the uh, aspirated content? Um, yeah, that's about it. Any, other, any questions? Anything that's not clear? Anything you want me to go through? Depth, no, just move on. And then um, a lot of people ask, uh, yeah, they say it's important to understand like the different arrangements of the different hilums of the lung. And I've seen some questions on that, but like I, I don't know why people emphasize on that. So um, the bronchus on the right side is kind of like more anterior, superior, and then your arteries are in the middle, and your these are your veins, and then yeah, and have a look at that on the left side. It's not the same. But you're unlikely to be looking at a lung of a patient and say which one, which lung is which, unless if you're a thoracic surgeon trying to do a, a lung transplant, in which case you probably know it by then. But yeah. So the lung and the lung and the pleura have different termination points. Uh, rule of twos again. So in your midclavicular line, your lungs end at around uh, rib six, and then pleura goes beyond your lung, so it ends at rib eight. So start from six, mid-clavicular line, mid-axillary line, and then mid-scapular line, and keep adding to six, eight, ten. 
8, 10, 12, just like that. Does that all make sense? And then, uh, so some of the nerves, important nerves in the thoracic wall. So you have your vagus nerve. So your vagus nerves, both of them run posterior to the hilum of the lung, whereas your phrenic nerves run anterior to the hilum of the lung. So they kind of like asking questions about, yeah, somebody damages a nerve that lungs that runs anterior to the uh, hilum of the lung, what are you gonna see? And they give you options for both. So important to know that. And then you also have your recurrent laryngeal nerve. So they're important for controlling your, your vocal cords. If you damage one of them, you get hoarse voice. If you damage two, um, you asphyxiate, probably die. Um, and then the left one, it loops around the ligamentum arteriosus here, so at the arch of the iota, whereas the right loops around the right uh, subclavian artery. Is that all good? Shall we keep going? And blood supply. Yeah, this is, uh, so what I tried to do last year to try and get my head around this is draw this and that like several times until I kind of understood what's going on. So, but the main thing is that you have your accessory hemi and your hemi on the left side and they both drain onto the um, azigas on the right side and then the posterior intercostals on the right side all drain onto the azigas and then the azigas goes into the superior vena cava at T45, thoracic plane. Red plant, remember that? Yep. Other than that, yeah. Just try and draw it out and in a way that makes more sense to you. Otherwise, we could spend the whole day going through that. And this is my attempt at drawing the arterial supply. So there's no good image on arterial supply. So I try to draw that myself, but it's not very visible. So that doesn't help much. Um, so you have your... So you have your, uh, your iota comes up and then gives off uh, at the back, so your uh, thoracic iota, you have your posterior intercostal arteries which come out and then give off your main uh, arteries that form the part, part of the main neurovascular bundle. Those are the ones that come up to the front and then they anastomose with branches of the internal thoracic which gives off the anterior branches. So the anterior branches are the ones that form part of the collateral, which is not very important. They come and anastomose at the front. And then um, you have different arteries that supply the diaphragm. The diaphragm is well vascularized, so try and remember that. Um, yeah, we'll go through that. And then lymph drainage, this is quite simpler to go through. So you have your deep uh, lymph nodes, which then go onto your pulmonary uh, lymph nodes and then come together with the superficial to drain into your bron bronchopulmonary hyalur nodes, which are around here. And then they go onto the tracheobronchial nodes, paratracheal nodes, which are over here, and then bronchomediastinal lymph trunk. And then the left goes onto the thoracic duct, the right goes onto the right lymphatic duct, which all then drain into your venous system. Does that make sense? So that's pretty much how a lung cancer could potentially spread to the rest of the body. But usually most cancers go to the lung because it receives all the blood from the heart. A bit about histology. So this is just a summary table, which I won't go through, but we'll go through the pictures. So uh, your trachea and bronchus pretty much have a similar structure. You have your uh, pseudo columnar epithelium and then a lamina propria and then some smooth muscles and you also have cartilage on that which keeps your airways open so if you feel around your trachea here you can kind of feel the, the cartilage and this is just the histology section of it and you have your esophagus behind the trachea so these are your conducting zones and then respiratory zone. So your conducting uh, bronchioles and terminal bronchioles are not respiratory. So this, I just did this for simplicity's sake. 
So your only respiratory so respiratory bronchioles are your respiratory bronchioles, and they're called respiratory for that. And then your alveoli and your, yeah, that. So those are the ones that are involved in respiration. Everything else is just conducting. It just helps air pass through onto the respiratory zone. Just remember that. And um, so as you as you go away, you don't you get rid of the cartilage, no cartilage here. And then as you go deeper into the lung, you get rid of the smooth muscles. And then here your um, alveoli duct and alveoli sacs do not have any smooth muscles. Yeah. So you can always oops, can always refer back to this table here, which will kind of tell you what's where. Histology doesn't, you don't get a lot of marks from histology. It's, it's, one of the, it's like microbiology, like if you have time to go through it, like really understand it, but if you don't, just take a guess. You'll probably be right anyway. Um, so your alveoli, you have, you have two, you have epithelial cells in your alveoli, and you have two types. There's ones that are involved in respiration, and there's ones that produce surfactant. Does anyone know what surfactant is? No? Yes? You know? Okay, cool. So surfactant helps reduce the surface tension of the water and it's produced by type 2 cells. And you also have alveolar macrophages which helps clear out things in the, in the lung. Any questions on uh, anatomy so far? No? Is that good? Shall we move on to physiology? Are we going for time? Oh my god, that's 25 minutes. Um, so I'll try and speed through this too. Uh, so the main actions of your uh, respiratory system gets exchanged, we know that. Uh, pH control, yep. Uh, so if you have metabolic acidosis, then you have respiratory compensation, you know, you know that, yeah. And then it's also important for speech. Like I said, you have your vocal for, uh, cause, air comes in, goes out, and temperature regulation. So if you have, like, if you breathe in cold air, it's gonna take out a lot of heat from your body to warm it up, et cetera which is not good. So it's divided into upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract. Um, there's a picture that you can look at. Other time. You can read that some other time. Um, we just talked about this. Yeah. So respiratory cycles, you have two stages, inspiration, expiration, and then you have different pressures which kind of regulate which way air moves in. Um, so you have your intra, intrapulmonary pressure and your atmospheric pressure. So this zero means that like, um, so the pressure in here is relative to atmospheric pressure. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's zero pressure. And then you also have your intrapleural pressure. And then the transpulmonary pressure is kind of what determines uh, the chest wall movement. Um, airflow. So airflow is reliant on pressure difference. You increase the volumes, you lower the pressure, Air gets in, you increase the pressure, lower the volume, air gets out. And uh, yeah, this is just about airflow. I know I have that there, but do you all understand this diagram? So air, you breathe in, increase volume, air rushes in, uh, and then fills up, and then expiration. So this is just the mechanics of breathing, so what muscles you use. So inspiration, diaphragm contracts, everything else can just stay the same. So the diaphragm contract and increases your um, thoracic volume. And then that decreases the volume. I mean, that increases the volume, decreases the pressure. So that means that atmospheric pressure is higher than the pressure inside the lung. So air will move into the lung. Uh, that's pretty much it. And you have like your, what's it called? Uh, the pump and bucket handle thing. So you think uh, the sternum is your pump with the ribs attached to it, and then your false ribs, which come out here, are your bucket kind of move up. So it's like, yeah, I look like an idiot. Oops, we'll move on. And then expiration is, is passive at rest. So you don't need any muscles to expire at rest. You only need muscles to expire when you're doing activity or when it's forced expiration. And these are the muscles you use, your intercostal muscles, abdominal muscles. So the main thing is you reduce your thoracic uh, volume, so which increases the pressure inside your lungs, and then you exhale. 
Does that all make sense? Yeah. And then lung compliance is just the tendency of the lung to change as the pulmonary pressure changes. So it's like if you change the pressure, how much would your lung change? If your lung is not that compliant, then you change your pressure and the lung volume doesn't change that much, which is not good. And it's really dependent on elasticity, so your connective tissue and the elasticity of your lung and also surface tension, which is why you need those uh, type 2 pneumocytes to be produced in that surfactant. It's very important for like the smaller um, uh, epithelium. And this is just about airway resistance. So you have your highest resistance in your uh, medium-sized airways and not the large ones. Yep, so there you go. Lung, elastin and fibrosis, et cetera. Thoracic wall deformities will impede your lung compliance. And that's just about surfactant. This is a diagram you can look at at different times. So if you have saline, um, see the pressure changes is much better than when you're just breathing in air. So this is what you call hysteresis, that there's a leg in your, um, there's a leg in the pressure and the volume. So if you look at that there, so this is just air and this is with saline. If you have, if you don't have any surfactant, then you have the, that there, that leg between the two uh, things you're looking at. Uh, gas exchange. So a couple of factors that affect gas dif uh, diffusion between the alveoli and capillaries. So your partial pressure of your different gases, we've already talked about that. So membrane thickness, which is why you have very thin uh, membrane at the alveoli to make it easy for gas to pass through. And if you have different pathologies that can affect that. And then the surface area and diffusion coefficient of a uh, gas is just how quickly the gas moves through. So ventilation, ventilation is just air moving into your lungs, yeah. You have like minute ventilation, if you wanna know that, alveolar ventilation. So alveolar ventilation is just the difference between your minute ventilation, like your total ventilation, and your ventilation of your dead space, or dead spaces, so that's air that you don't use. So you have anatomic dead space, which is air that's in the conducting zones, and you have physiological, which is kind of functional, but it's in uh, alveoli or respiratory zones that aren't really respi respiring because they are not adequately perfused. So if you don't have perfusion, then you don't have any gas exchange. So that's just a summary there. And factors that affect uh, ventilation, so your airway resistance, how, enough, how narrow or wide your airways are, and the work of breathing. And this is just to show that medium-sized bronchi have the highest resistance. So typical asthma question, which airway would you have problems with in asthma? These are the guys. Small airways are not very resistant because there's too many of them. So they have a high surface area. And then perfusion, so uh, blood flow in the pulmonary system, this is a low pressure system. Um, if you compare the pressures here on, if you compare the pressure of your pulmonary system in your systemic circulation, so systemic is around 120 on 80, so this is quite small, and you have very thin walled arteries, so there's low vascular resistance, and resistance in these arteries is invest to the lung volume. So if you increase the volume, you decrease the resistance so that more blood flows to your lung and then it can get oxygenated. But if you decrease the volume so you don't want blood coming into your lungs, then you're trying to send it away, get out of here, and then, yep. And so your ventilation perfusion ratio is kind of, is kind of important because so, you need a good match between the two for you to be well uh, oxygenated. And then, so the VDQ ratio is the lowest at the lung basis. And that's, so um, ventilation across the lung, you can kind of think of it as being the same throughout. The problem is perfusion. So perfusion is not the same along, across the lung. So it decreases as you go up. This is just the effect of gravity. So which means that your um, perfusion would be the lowest at the base, which would mean that the VQ ratio is the lowest at the base. And then VQ mismatch. Any, anyone have any questions so far? Keep going. Okay. Um, you get a VQ mismatch when you have a mismatch of ventilation and perfusion. I think that's pretty straightforward.
speak for it. So VQ coupling is quite important, as I said. Um, so if you have, so it's different from what happens in the systemic circulation in your body. So in your body, if you have an area that has a lot of carbon dioxide, not enough oxygen, you want to send more blood to it so that you give it more oxygen and take away the carbon dioxide and other uh, products of metabolism. But then in the lung, if you have little oxygen and a lot of carbon dioxide, you stop blood from going there because you don't you want blood to be going to areas that have a lot of oxygen because you're trying to oxygenate blood. So this is pretty much what this picture is saying. Um, gas transport. So uh, carbon dioxide, three main ways to transport carbon dioxide. You can either dissolve it in hemoglobin to form carbamino hemoglobin, and then, but most of it is uh, transported via bicarbonate. A little bit is dissolved in plasma. And then oxygen, so there's the whole cooperative binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. So hemoglobin has like iron and stuff, which binds oxygen. And you have the two, two um, effects, the, the Haldane effect and the Bohr effect. So the best way to remember this, left side, I mean left shift, lung, and Haldane has an L, so lung there. So that's what happens at the lung. So you get to the lung, you load on oxygen and unload CO2 at the lungs, and then Bohr effect, you go to the tissues and you unload your O2 and uh, load CO2, so right shift. So this is kind of all the things that, yeah. And this is just a summary of the circulation. So carbon dioxide plus water with the help of carbonic anhydrase give you your that intermediate, and then you get bicarbonate and some iron. Uh, we're almost there. Yeah. So respiratory drive. So this is pretty much like how you uh, control respiration. So respiration is is a fairly autonomic thing. Um, you don't really control how you breathe. You can intervene to stop it, but like there's a um, pattern generator that just gets you breathing in and out in the pons and medulla but you need to be able to moderate it somehow. Like if you want to eat, you can't be eating and breathing at the same time. So that's why that's important. And the main driver for this is carbon dioxide. Just remember that like carbon dioxide is your main inspiratory driver, not oxygen. So you get oxygen being your main inspiratory driver when you have prolonged periods of hypercapnia. So if you have chronic hypercapnia, your kidneys compensate by producing a lot more uh, bicarbonate, which kind of mops out the hydrogen ions that you get from CO2, and then oxygen becomes your main driver of respiration. And the way CO2 drives uh, respiration is mostly at your central receptors. So CO2 can't cross the blood-brain barrier, so it gets into the CSF and then produces um, a lot of hydrogen ions, which can then go on cross the blood-brain barrier and then uh, give the brain an idea of how much CO2 is in the body. So the H plus in the CSF tends to be proportional to the CO2 in the serum. Does that all make sense? And this, these are just diagrams to show you, kind of show you why CO2 um, is a better driver, better inspiratory driver than O2 and pH. So if you look at this, small changes of CO2 lead to significant changes in alveolar ventilation. Big changes of uh, oxygen in order for you to increase uh, your alveolar ventilation. So you, you need your oxygen to drop to be significantly low in, before you start acting on it, which is what you, you don't really want that. By that time, things are pretty bad. And then uh, pulmonary function test. So spirometry main thing is to measure FVC, FEV1, FEV1 ratio. And it doesn't measure any capacity that involves dead space. So that's done with uh, body, never know how to pronounce this word, so yeah. Or you can use helium dilution. And then FEV1, FVC, that's what you kind of use to determine whether you have an obstructive lung disease or restrictive lung, restrictive lung disease. Uh, FEV1, FVC is reduced in obstructive and can be normal or increased in restrictive lung disease. I think I have another slide about this. 
Another thing you can do is measure DLCO. So that kind of tells you the deficient capacity of the lungs. And it's really dependent on surface area. So if you have something like emphysema or lobectomy, you have less surface area. So your DLCO will increase. But, or if you have fibrosis, then you, your membranes become thicker. It makes it difficult for that gas to pass through. And then that also increases your DLCO. Yeah, you can remember that. So you could get a question where they just show you this picture and say, figure out which one it is, whether it's obstructive or uh, restrictive. And the reason why um, FEV1 or FVC may increase in restrictive is because your FVC decreases because your lung is not very compliant and it can't fill in as much as it used to. And these are your lung volumes. So capacity is combination of two volumes. And then the others are just volumes. Just know those two. Yeah, microbiology. So uh, yeah, you have rhinitis, which is probably one of the most important. And then pneumonia is also important. The others are just, yeah, like know them if you can. But I uh, try and understand like the normal flora of the upper respiratory tract. So upper respiratory tract, you have stuff aureus, strep epididymis, strep pneumonia, nasaria, and hemophilus influenza. And when you think about it, these are the ones which are likely to cause infections when they get into the lung, because like they normally occupy your upper respiratory tract. So if they get into the lung, they cause problems. Um, yep, so community acquired pneumonia, most common cause is strep pneumonia. Strep pneumonia, pneumonia is in the name. And then followed by H influenza. But if it's hospital acquired, that's a different case. So you have MRSA. I think anything that's hospital, you can pretty much take a bet that it's likely to be MRSA. So. And you have your pseudomonas and stuff. So um, this is from last year's revision lecture. I just copied and pasted it. So you can look at that. I've highlighted the common ones like rhinitis, so usually viral, so you don't just prescribe antibiotics, and that can lead to otitis media, especially in children. Uh, yeah, pneumonia, stroke, pneumonia, the others, yeah, you can go through that. So respiratory farm is actually pretty okay, it's quite easy. You have Saba, Laba, Sama, Lama, <laughs> and the others. Those are the ones which you really need to know, like your SABA is your, um, and the adverse effects of SABAs. Uh, and you also have uh, corticosteroids, so make sure to tell your patients to wash their mouth after they use any inhaled corticosteroids, otherwise they start getting oral thrush. Yep, you can go through that. And um, ask, how much time do you have? Okay, yeah, still have time. So asthma, this is just hyper-responsive airways. Anyone in here have asthma? Probably do, yeah, shouldn't ask that. Um, you have intrinsic asthma and extrinsic asthma. Extrinsic asthma is allergic, so that's the one with your IgE and stuff. And really the definition is if you can get, because asthma is supposed to be reversible, so you need to be able to reverse that with a bronchodilator. So any um, <coughs> obstruction should be reversible by at least uh, increase in top by 12% plus an increase of at least 200 milliliters of either FEV1 or FVC, doesn't have to be both. And acute asthma attack is where your FEV1 or FVC is less than 0 0.7, which is, this is, yeah. Because if you have severe asthma, your FEV1 and FVC are usually below 0 0.7 at rest, so, yeah. So this is just more for somebody with mild to moderate asthma. And your early phase of your asthma attack is your bronchoconstriction or spasm and mucus secretion. So your immune response is the late response. They, they had a lot of asthma questions last year in the via, which I don't know why, but yeah. I guess it's a common condition. So remember this, and you can look at this diagram for kind of what happens and all the different drugs that you use. Um, clinical presentation, wheeze, cough, dyspnea, chest tightness. If there's a history of atopy, definitely go with asthma. And 
the way you treat asthma is a stepwise approach. So everyone has a saba because that's your reliever. If you are symptomatic, then um, you want you want to have a saba. And then well, as you go on, as it gets more severe, you start adding things: inhaled corticosteroid, inhaled corticosteroid plus laba, and so on and so forth. You never give a laba by itself. Remember that. Uh, yeah, COPD. So COPD has two main causes. You have emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Do you guys know the whole pink puffer, blue bloater thing? No? So pink puffer is emphysema. So that's your guy who comes in pink, short of breath, very cachexic, that's it. And that's because they are breathing too much. So normally, like your... Um, Breathing takes about 5% of your basal metabolic rate. So if you're breathing too much, then that means you're burning a lot of energy and you become thin. Whereas your blue bloater comes in, they're cyanotic, they're obese, and they smoke a lot. So that's the chronic bronchitis. And COPD is not reversible. So if you give somebody a bronchodilator and then measure the uh, lung volumes, they won't be reversed. Yes, so this is also from last year's uh, revision slides. You can go through this. Um, this is just all the different conditions and how they tend to present. Carcinoma of the lung, especially at the apexes, that's what you get your you, that's where you get your Horner syndrome. So when you're doing a RASP exam, why do you look for like your facial droop and anhydrosis? That's why. Uh, pink frothy sputum, APO, pulmonary edema. Wherever you see that. Don't even think twice about it. So we'll go through some questions. We have 15 minutes. Anyone have any questions or anything that they would like to clarify? Or should we go straight to it? Should we do questions or? Yeah? OK. I'm not going to read them out loud because, yeah. So when you're done reading and have an answer, somebody just yell out something. Yeah, shall we move on? Yep. Cool. Do we all agree on amoxicillin? I mean, you don't just hand out vancomycin. That's like one of your last line drugs if you do that patient, yeah. Um, doxycycline either. I mean, I don't know what that is. Amoxicillin, yeah. Clinical signs of asthma may include. What's the answer? A, yep. Where do you get dull percussion notes? Can't hear? Yep. Or a pleural effusion. So pleural effusion, stony dull. Consolidation, just dull. Uh, in an asthmatic patient, there's typically reduced airflow. If nothing else changes, this will result in? That's pretty straightforward, right? We don't have to go through that. Uh, yep. What was the answer? Yeah. E? Did you say E or A or B? E. Cool. And what do IgEs activate? Yep, I think I talked about this. What's the answer? B? Yeah. Why is it not E? True. So like the, the trick about a lot of these questions is don't overthink it. 
was like, you could say, yeah, but what about IgE? But just don't overthink it. If it's not there, don't think about it. Don't overthink it. If you overthink it, you're going to fail. Okay, you won't fail. You get it wrong, sorry. You won't fail, but you'll get it wrong. It's actually a bit difficult to fail if you think about it because there's not many people who fail. Yep. MRSA in the hospital. Oh, the answer? Yeah. This is a bit of a long one. B, any other takers? No, just B? I think somebody was trying to say something else, no? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so answer is B. Is that all good? Shall we keep going? Do you have an answer? So whoever said D, it's not reduced, it's increased. Yeah. What's the answer? Anyone have an answer? E? Yep. So with consolidation, you get coarse crackles. When you get a uh, fibrosis, you can also get crackles, but they are fine crackles. So it's like coarse crackles, fine crackles. So these would be coarse crackles. If anyone has any questions, just yell it out. D? So, phrenic nerve? Yeah, that's a pretty easy question. So they try and have like a spread of questions in the exam. So there will be some that are like very easy. There'll be some that are like moderately difficult and there'll be some which which are like, yeah, what the fuck is this? Um, we had some histology questions where they asked us about cell size and I was like, are you, are you, are you mad? Yeah. So this is mostly used for COPD.
we all go good with that. So you have beta-1 receptors in your heart. So if you activate that, then you get tachycardia. Is that all good? So that's your Saba. Or oh, answer E? Yep. So you don't always have to use LABA with ICS, but always have to use ICS. I mean, no, the other way around. Like, you can use ICS by itself, but you can't use LABA by itself. Yeah. For some reason, it can, it can cause dysphonia. I don't know why. I tried looking this up yesterday, but I couldn't find an answer. Uh, yeah. Yeah, do you guys get a lot of EMQs, do you? You do? Sometimes, yeah? Okay, we'll do this then. Didn't really talk about this, but surgery, immobility, Yep. Vicos triad? You know, you know that? Yep. Why is it worse on inspiration? The pleuritic chest pain. Do you have an answer? JVP, edema, ascites. JVP, edema, ascites, that all screens one thing. Right heart failure. So copulmonary is right heart failure from uh, lung issue. They smoke a lot, their lung gets fucked up, so you get COPD, and then you get pulmonary hypertension, which then leads to the right heart failure, and then you get congestion. That's why you get your descended JVP, ascites, and edema. So APO, APO, you'd get lung symptoms. Does that all make sense? Oh yeah, do you have lung? That's very long, so I'm going to skip that. <laughs> they have fever. Do you have an answer? Do you have an answer? So all these questions have answers. Like you can go through them later on. I think Alex is ready to give his uh, talk. Uh, let's do that one. Arrangement of the hilum. Remember that? It's quite important, but very useless. <laughs> yeah. I didn't really talk about this, but yeah. Do you guys know what I said? tubes and stuff. 
Yeah, so with a tension pneumothorax, second intercostal place, space, mid uh, trabecular line. Pneumothorax, like your spontaneous C. Does that all make sense? Yeah? Cool. So first of all, what is the organ? Or the structure that is being pointed at? Somebody say the iota, right? Yep. Yeah. So where does it where does it start? Rule of twos. Iota is at the very bottom. Rule of twos. All good? All understand that? So what are, what are we pointing at here? Yep, somebody yelled it, esophagus. What kind of pain does it mimic? See, yep. Yeah, that's it from me. Oh, is that supposed to happen? Any last minute questions? Good. I've got these. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's good. How are you going? Um, huh? No, I don't think it is. It's good enough. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> some 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 is a request. Um, some year is a question, I think. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't think any of your ears are here. Um, That's all right. Yeah. yeah. I've got Lucy and Whitney here. Hi. Hi. Well, so they're from Warren as well. So. Thank you. Um, do you guys want like a two minute break? I don't think, I think we're good to go. Um, yeah. And you can go on for a little bit longer than our second video. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. We've got heaps of questions there and we weren't going to go through all of them, but we'll see how else we go to the front. Oh, I want to. If we still have time to go through them, but if not, then you guys can go through them. Yeah. Um, I've got a double read. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm not sure if we'll do it. Yeah, no, yeah, that's good enough. Um, you've got a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit Hello everyone, my name is Alex and I've got um, Whitney and Lucy here with me to help me with this GRG revision lecture. Um, do you guys want like a one or two minute break or are you just are you good to go straight into this? Cause Straight into it. Cool. Um, <laughs> so feel free to ask um, questions anytime. If it's like maybe a harder or more difficult question, maybe save it to the end because there's a lot of stuff to go through. Um, and just a disclaimer, we will be going quite quickly through a lot of this information because, as you know, GIT is the biggest topic and the most examinable. So we've got lots to go through and some slides will just fly through. But if you want us to stop and explain something, just let us know. Um, so I think Whitney will be starting us off. All right, so I'm sure you've seen this. So when we talk about the blood supply, there's the three main arteries that we need to focus on. And is my mouse going to? Right, cool. So we've got um, the celiac trunk with the three main branches, common hepatic, left gastric, and splenic. And some of the important kind of buzzword things to know about this picture is when you've got a duodenal ulcer, if it burns through the back wall, it can hit the gastroduodenal artery. And similarly with the gastric um, also, if it burns through the posterior wall of the stomach, it'll hit the splenic artery. And if you hear anything in an EMQ or something that says like a tortuous artery, it's probably referring to the splenic artery because it's really tortuous. Um, superior mesenteric, again, just knowing these images, um, the three that I've got up here are probably the best if you can draw them out and know it, that'll be great. Um, comes out at L1 and there's not too much that's important about this one. Supplies the majority of the small intestine. 
Um, this one has got some important points. So coming out at L3, there's um, the marginal artery that's the connecting artery between the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric arteries. And this point is going to be um, two thirds along the transverse colon. And if you've got, say, a clot or um, a hypertension event kind of thing, this will be the first point to be infarcted because it's the furthest away from the blood supply sources. As well as if one of the, say, superior or inferior mesenteric artery is infarcted, the marginal artery can kind of give collateral blood supply. That sometimes um, comes up in questions. Um, the veins, I'm sure you guys have heard of the portal poodle. So this is just a simplified version of it. You've got the splenic vein coming across here, which joins the inferior mesenteric vein, and then the um, superior mesenteric vein will join here and go into the liver. So just knowing where they join is important. And this is kind of a um, large image. We've got the splenic here, the inferior and the superior mesenteric vein. And some important things here is just in relation to portal hypertension. So when you've got portal hypertension, you'll have the backlog of blood and you'll end up with esophageal varices from here. You'll end up with splenomegaly as well as hemorrhoids down here. Cool. So um, with the innovation of the gut, this is incredibly complex. So what I've actually done is I was going to try and draw it out for you guys, but it would probably take me like 25 minutes. So I put this really, really good link. Um, I highly encourage you to just sit down for like an hour, have a watch. It only goes for 10 minutes, but just try and draw it out in this kind of diagrammatic way rather than kind of trying to understand like all like the actual picture in the intestines and like the innovation, that kind of thing. Just watch this. Um, so splanchnic, it's kind of a confusing concept, but it's essentially, um, so we have our sympathetic innervation of the gut, we have our paravertebral sympathetic chain along right, either side of the um, vertebral column, um, and what's happening, splanchnic means that the post-ganglionic um, neuron is not exiting at the level of the um, parasympathetic chain. It's going to go into the parasympathetic chain and then travel a little bit further. This contrasts with, um, so innovation of, um, say, things in your thorax where you're going to have your pre-ganglionic um, nerve entering your sympathetic chain and it's going to go in like your grey and white re rami communicans and then synapse and exit. With the splanchnic, you're going to go in, you're not going to synapse, you're going to exit and then you're going to synapse later um, in front of your aorta at one of the plexuses. So I understand this is, yeah, very complex. I don't want to confuse you further, so I just really encourage you to um, watch this video down here. I think. Oh, okay. So I did a bit more work on this this morning. I didn't realise you were putting up the um, special slides. Um, but these are, so on the right here, these are the kind of five or six different plexuses that arise in front of the aorta, and this is where the synapse is going to take place. So as you can see in the top right, you're going to exit through your ventral horn and you're going to pass through your grey communicans. Um, grey? White? I'm not too sure. I don't remember. <laughs> um, and anyway, instead of synapsing at that paravertebral chain, you're going to exit and then that little kind of ganglion that you see where the green bit is, that's representing one of the plexuses in front of the aorta. Again, just watch the video, please. <laughs> So um, talking about the abdominal wall, there's going to be your three flat muscles. So you'll have the external oblique, which you can think about running by putting your hands in your front pockets. Your internal oblique will run sort of if you're taking your hands out of your back pockets. And then your transverse abdominus is running horizontally. And then you've got two um, vertical muscles, the rectus abdominis, and then no one cares about the pyramidalis, but it's there. So um, rectus sheath and arcuate line, this is probably going to be a question on the exam, it always is. So the flat muscles, all of them, so those internal, external and transverse, have their aponeurotic sheath. So just after the muscle bulk, there's kind of this um, sheath that extends out here. And they are going to move either in front or behind of the rectus abdominis and create a rectus sheath. Also in pyramidalis, but no one cares. Um, the arcuate line, which was here occurs about three quarters of the way down the abdomen and what that is is you've got beneath that line all of the sheaths will move in front of the rectus abdominis whereas superior to that line what you get is the external will just move in front the internal splits in half half goes in front half goes behind and then the um, transverse will go posterior to that 
Um, something else about the arcuate line is um, the inferior epigastric vessels will perforate the rectus abdominis at that arcuate line. So, good to know. Layers of the abdominal wall moving from the skin inwards. We've got skin, campus fascia, scarpus fascia, just remembering that you camp outdoors, so that's going to be the more um, external layer. The external oblique muscle, so you're like, mm. <laughs> the external oblique muscle, internal oblique muscle, transverse abdominis, then you get some um, more fascia, so you get the transversalis fascia, extra peritoneal fascia, parietal peritoneum and visceral peritoneum. So it's just really good to have in your mind where all those layers are, as well as what happens with the aponeurosis fibers there. Oh, question time. <coughs> Shout it out. Does anyone want to shout it out? I hear like, yeah. yes. yes, good. Um, right. um, so you guys have probably heard this little trick. It's just about the openings in the diaphragm where we have things passing from the thoracic into the abdominal cavity. So the three openings that we have in the diaphragm are um, allow for the passage of the vena cava. So vena cava has eight letters, passes through at TH. Oesophagus has 10 letters, passes through at T10. Aortic hiatus, bit of a weird one, but um, has 12 letters apparently. So T12 is where it passes through. Ooh. Okay, so the abdominal cavity, we have it lined by peritoneum, which is a bit of a confusing concept again. Hopefully I can clarify it a little bit, but we have two continuous layers. So the visceral peritoneum, which covers your um, intraperitoneal organs, and then the parietal peritoneum, which lines the abdominal cavity. So the blue one, as you can see, is the visceral, the red one is the parietal. Um, and then we have, um, yep, yeah. so then we have double folds of this peritoneum, and we call it a menta when it's passing between the stomach and another organ. So we have the lesser omentum between the stomach and the liver, and the greater omentum between the stomach and the transverse colon. The greater omentum forms this kind of big apron. It's important in surgery. You need to kind of like flip it out of the way to see what's going on underneath. And also it's kind of the um, police of the abdomen. So in the case of infection, you're gonna have the greater omentum kind of um, crawling over the front and attaching nice and securely to the site of infection. So in the case that you have rupture and bacteria going everywhere, it's gonna be contained by the greater omentum and it's not going to spill um, and cause like extreme kind of peritonitis. Um, so the lesser omentum is formed by two ligaments. We have a picture. Yep, so we have the hepatoduodenal ligament and we have the hepatogastric ligament and the importance of this is that we have the portal triad, um, which is the hepatic artery, portal vein and bile duct um, passing from here into the gastrointestinal tract and that runs in the hepatoduodenal ligament. Um, and the importance of this, whoop, is in an operation called the Pringle maneuver. So if we have lots of bleeding from the liver, we can actually put our finger inside um, or behind the hepatoduodenal ligament through um, a space called the foramen of Winslow or the epiploic foramen, and we can actually clamp off the, um, the portal triad so that we don't have lots of blood kind of coming out. So I'll flip back again, sorry. Um, so mesentery, again, is referring to peritoneum, but it's peritoneum that's con connecting internal organs to the posterior abdominal wall. So just remembering the difference between the peritoneum, the mesentery, and the omentum is really important. So the peritoneum is going to form the greater and lesser sac, so anterior to the um, this visceral, visceral peritoneum here is this um, greater sac and behind is the lesser sac. As I said before, we do have one communication between the greater and lesser and that's that epiploic foramen that you can stick your finger through. Um, and again, this is a potential space, so it has a little bit of lubricating fluid and the significance of this is in the, um, the case of, say, hepatic dysfunction, you can have a massive collection of fluid in the um, the greater sac called ascites. So that's just a really good thing to know for exams. Yep, so a few more pictures just to explain. And that's just a fun diagram to look through later. <laughs> um, so again, the visceral peritoneum, so that's the one that's gonna line your internal organs. It's sensitive to quite a few things. Um, so inflammation, ischemia, stretch spasm, but not laceration, so not kind of like really sharp, intense pain. 
Um, so what we have instead is this kind of diffuse sensation of pain that's referred to um, particular dermatomes of the embryological origin. So you have um, any organs that have, are derived from um, kind of the foregut is going to refer to your epigastrium, so just above your belly button. Anything derived from your midgut will refer to your umbilicus, so around your belly button. And anything from the hindgut will refer to the suprapubic or hypogastric region, they're the same words essentially. Um, and it will be that really kind of diffuse pain. So then we have the parietal peritoneum, so this is lining the abdominal cavity. And in contrast to the visceral peritoneum, this is really like fine um, and really sensitive, well localised sensation of pain. So this is going to refer to, sorry, it's not going to be referred pain, but it's supplied by nerves that innervate the adjacent body wall, um, such as the thoracoabdominal nerves and the phrenic nerves. Um, and yeah, it is sensitive to pain in contrast to that really diffuse pain that is visceral. Um, the importance of peritoneum is when we have damage to the peritoneum, we can have um, kind of scarring that results in peritoneal adhesion, so when um, organs stick together, um, and that can lead to like a volvulus, particularly in the sigmoid colon, or a bowel obstruction. So that's really important kind of surgically. Um, and then just drawing together the concept of diffuse um, and localised pain, we can think about appendicitis in the appendix. So appendix has some weird functions that we don't really know if they really exist, I suppose. So it's okay to take the appendix out when it's causing a bit of trouble. Um, so appendicitis is inflammation of the appendix. What happens first is it's going to irritate the visceral peritoneum. So the organ's going to irritate the, the peritoneum just lining it and remembering that that was really kind of diffuse pain. We don't really know what it is and it's derived from the midgut. So firstly, we're going to feel um, the, the pain just around our umbilicus. Um, and then as it becomes more and more inflamed, it's going to start irritating the parietal peritoneum where it sits. And we know that that's really kind of localised sharp pain. So we're going to have um, that localised sharp pain at McBurney's point. Have you guys heard about McBurney's? Yeah, okay. So one third between your aces and your umbilicus is McBurney's. Just that concept of shif shifting pain is really important to know. So intraperitoneal versus retroperitoneal. Intraperitoneal, we have the eight anterior and posterior surfaces of the organ lined by visceral peritoneum, whereas the retroperitoneal organs, we have only its anterior surface covered by per peritoneum. Um, so a good way to remember retroperitoneals, per retroperitoneal organs is the mnemonic sad pucker, and just remember that all the rest are intraperitoneal. Um, and then retroperitoneal, you can divide into primary and secondary. So primary, they have always been outside. They've always been behind um, peritoneum when they um, developed in the embryo, embryo and when you've grown up into a big adult. <laughs> and then secondarily, it was initially retroperitoneal, but what happens is the organ starts to move towards um, your posterior abdominal wall and then the um, the peritoneum that was lining the posterior surface of the organ actually fuses to the back of the wall, so you only have the anterior surface covered in the end. Important spaces. So males and females, it's important to know um, the difference between the two. So in males, we have a bladder and a rectum, whereas females, we have an extra uterus, or just a uterus. <laughs> Um, so we can only have fluid collecting in one space for males, and that's in the recto-vesical pouch. So vesical was bladder. Um, and it's important to know that the peritoneal cavity is enclosed, so there's no real potential for spread of infection. This contrasts with females, so we have the three organs now, so there's two potential spaces where it can collect, but the recto-uterine pouch, also known as the pouch of Douglas, is kind of the most um, inferior um, space, so that's where your fluid's more likely to collect, particularly in kind of ascites conditions. Um, and it's important to know that there is a continuation between the fem female genital tract and the um, abdominal cavity. So if you have an infection in the female genital tract, then it can spread to the abdomen. Okay, so um, this is just a diagram of all the hernias you can get, but I think the only two important ones for this level is sort of the femoral and the inguinal hernias. So Hesselbach's triangle is also very important. Um, Hesselbach's triangle is going to have the border of the inferior epigastric vessels, the inguinal ligament, and then the rectus abdominis. So this will be looking on the left side of the body. And this 
um, space, this Hesselback triangle provides a site of weakness in the abdominal wall and um, this site of weakness allows the internal organs to protrude through. So that'll be a direct hernia because it's going directly through the wall. Um, and we can use the inferior epigastrics to kind of locate if it's a direct or indirect hernia. So as I said, when you're medial to the epigastric, it's going to be direct. And then we've got the deep inguinal ring arising lateral to our epigastric arteries, and that will be an indirect. So just to go over that again. So our indirect are going to be moving through the deep inguinal ring and then coming out the superficial inguinal ring, and that will be lateral to our epigastric arteries. And as I've said, the direct is moving directly through the Hesselbach's triangle. I swear this is always a question, so just be able to remember which one's on the medial and lateral side of those arteries. Two or three questions, according to Alex. Um, in contrast to the femoral um, hernias, which are more common in females, um, you've got this femoral canal. Um, you can use navel to help you remember the order of the structures. Moving lateral to fem uh, lateral femoral, lateral to medial, will have the nerve, the artery, the vein, the empty space, which is the canal that you'll have the hernia protruding through, um, and then some lip tissue. Comparing this to our inguinal hernias, the femoral will be more inferior and lateral to the um, inguinal ligament and the uh, tubercle here as well. Speak of the devil. Shout it out. Hey, yeah, I heard someone. So just to go over the um, process vaginalis, I'm sure you guys are all over embryonic stuff because we undergrad, our postgrads didn't do any embryology. So it's just that um, the embryonic developmental outpouching that allows the passage of things from the um, abdomen into the scrotum. So failure to close of that will lead this potential space for hernias to protrude through. Okay, so we're gonna start going all the way through the tract now. All right, so nothing really to know about the mouth. Um, just know the three salivary glands that the prod is the largest, and you've got some clinical findings. So chronic alcoholism, it can be enlarged and mumps as well. And then I'm not gonna say that and make a fool of myself. So that there is when you've got excess elevation and you can treat it with um, muscarinic antagonists. So basically you're antagonizing the parasympathetic, the rest and digest function. And then this one is when you've got insufficient salivation and you're gonna do the opposite. You're going to try and enhance the parasympathetic function by giving a muscarinic agonist. Moving on. So the esophagus, um, we know that there are three constrictions. There's the upper esophageal sphincter, there's the arch of the aorta, which pushes on the esophagus and creates a constriction, and then the diaphragmatic opening also provides a constriction. The upper sphincter is voluntary and the lower sphincter is involuntary. Um, when we're talking about the drainage of the esophagus, the um, superior two thirds will drain into our systemic system through the azigous vein, and the inferior will go through the portal system. And just drilling that in, that's when you get your esophageal varices because you can have the backlog of blood in portal hypertension. Um, and it's just kind of like, think like hemorrhoids, but the esophagus. Um, some conditions to be aware of. So gourd, um, commonly known as heartburn, it's when you've got the loss of the integrity of the lower esophageal sphincter and you get the um, acid and the contents of the stomach refluxing back up. It'll be worse on lying down, having spicy food and coffee. Something that can lead to reflux is hiatal hernias. So when you've got um, part of the esophagus or the stomach moving above the diaphragm, there's two types, the sliding and the rolling. Sliding, just imagine that you grab the esophagus and you pull it up and it takes both the sphincter and part of the stomach with it here. This is the more common one. Whereas rolling, you still have your sphincter beneath the diaphragm, but part of the stomach has rolled above. Some other things, um, when you're vomiting up bright red blood, that can be due to esophageal varices. Um, it could also be due to cancer or Mallory Weiss tears, which is associated with um, vomiting after a big night out. Um, and you'll get these longitudinal tears. Something else, if you're vomiting up coffee ground vomit, very buzzword, it's that you've got partially digested blood that's being vomited up. And this partially digested blood could be coming from a peptic ulcer that's perforated, or if you've got chronic inflammation gastritis. Um, Achalasia, it's just uh, you've got lower esophageal sphincter is permanently constricted, 
and here you can see. Um, and I guess it's just kind of one of those niche things to know, achalasia, it's when you've got um, loss of the lower esophageal sphincter function and you can have people that try to swallow food but they just feel like it's going to come straight back up or they can't swallow it properly. Barrett's esophagitis, so when you've got um, acid sitting in the esophagus, acid shouldn't really be there because it should be all contained within the stomach. When you compare this to in the intestine where you have the stomach contents being dumped into it and it's got mucus and it's ready to, um, it's able to deal with that acid. So when you've got acid sitting in the esophagus where it shouldn't be, those cells will begin to change and um, called metaplasia into types of intestinal cells to be able to handle that acid. So we go from a stratified squamous, um, which is the normal esophagus lining, into the simple columnar intestinal type to try and better deal with the acid being there. And this is um, this metaplasia predisposes someone to getting cancer. So Barrett's esophagitis is a big risk factor for getting esophageal cancer. So the stomach now. Um, the stomach, we've got the uh, cardiac notch, the fundus, the body, um, the pyloric antrum, and the pyloric sphincter here got the lesser curve and the greater curvature as well. Stomach's got smooth muscles and outer longitudinal inner circular and innermost oblique layer. There's rugae, which is sort of just like, you know, rugae. Um, and they increase, increase the intestinal surface area to be able to act really um, well to churn the food into chyme. And then there's the transpyloric plane at L1. Again, this is just one of those things that you just have to sort of know. So here's a list of all the things that occur at the transpyloric plane. Can't help you there. Um, so gastric pits, these um, are, when you're zooming into the structure of the stomach's lining, it's important to know the cells that are there, what they secrete, and what the function of that secretory molecule is. Don't worry so much about where, um, I guess, the cells differ across the lining. Just going with the pits, we've got um, there's mucus cells, which uh, will produce mucus, and that's really important for protecting the lining. Also bicarbonate is very important for protection. Parietal cells are secreting our gastric acid as well as intrinsic factor, which is really important for B12 absorption later down the line. You've got enterochromophon-like cells, which um, secrete histamine. Chief cells, which is your pepsinogen, your gastric lipase. D cells and G cells. G cells secrete gastrin. Gastrin stimulates acid. D cells secrete somatostatin, and that will inhibit gastric acid secretion. Just going into the gastric acid secretion itself, so we have um, our carbon dioxide and our water will combine to form carbonic acid, and then that will dissociate into our hydrogen and our bicarbonate ion. Bicarbonate ion will be exchanged with chloride on the um, basolateral surface of the parietal cells. And this means when you've got all this bicarbonate sitting in the, um, the blood supply, it'll create this alkaline tide. Um, then the chloride, when that's been brought in, it will just immediately shuffle over and go down a concentration gradient into the lumen of the stomach. So we come back here with our um, hydrogen ion that will go into water and then dissociate again. And over here, this is really the most important part, I think, when you've got your ATPase, your hydrogen and your potassium exchange pump. So the hydrogen is going against an extremely con strong concentration gradient because in the stomach, it's very acidic. So there's already so much hydrogen ion that you'd think that it wouldn't need any more. So that's why we need ATP to be able to push it against its concentration gradient and brings potassium in. Then when you've got your hydrogen ion and your chloride, you get your hydrochloric acid, which is your stomach's acid. So just going into what will stimulate this acid secretion again. So the biggest part is getting those um, hydrogen potassium ATPA pumps onto the, um, the luminal surface. And what will do that is it'll be um, gastrin, histamine, acetylcholine, so acetylcholine, our parasympathetic rest and digest kind of function. Um, they will promote the insertion of these pumps into the lumen, luminal wall, um, and increase acid secretion. Histamine is important for nighttime acid secretion, and as we've said, somatostatin will um, decrease the acid secretion. Phases of gastric acid secretion, there's three. The cephalic phase, the gastric phase, the intestinal phase. I won't go into all of this side, but just think cephalic phase is when you see food, you smell food, you want to eat it, so then you'll start um, to produce saliva and also 
acid in the stomach for that parasympathetic innervation. When the food hits the stomach and you've got not only the contents of the food in there but the distension of the stomach, that will also increase the acid secretion. And then the intestinal phase, when the food is dumped into the intestine and you've got the distension of the intestine, it will go back and inhibit those signals to reduce acid secretion. A note about pepsinogen. So we said cheek cells are going to release pepsinogen. Parietal cells will secrete our hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is really important to be able to cleave pepsinogen into pepsin, and then that pepsin will be able to go on and cleave all the rest of pepsinogen into pepsin. So you need both of those steps to be able to break down our proteins into peptides. Um, peptic ulcer disease, it's um, in the stomach, we've got our protective factors and our aggressive factors, and we've spoken about a few of them already. So the protective factors are our mucus, bicarbonate, prostaglandins, and the prostaglandins are really important to enhance our blood flow to the stomach, which will in turn increase the mucus and the bicarbonate. Um, conversely, our aggressive factors are our acid, H. pylori, heard of him, um, ethanol, and NSAIDs. Um, NSAIDs will reduce the prostaglandins, which will then therefore reduce the blood flow to the stomach and reduce your bicarbonate and mucus secretion. So when you've got um, an imbalance of these and more aggressive factors, you get an ulcer. And don't forget that when you've got a gastric ulcer, if it burns through the posterior wall, it'll hit the splenic artery. Duodenal ulcer, it'll hit the gastro-duodenal artery. Um, appetite control, this is a really good picture and there's always a question on this. So the hypothalamus is your regulator of your appetite control. You've got these funkily named agouti-related peptide, neuropeptide Y and POMC cart neurons. So what happens is the stomach, when it's hungry, it will be growling, so it will be releasing ghrelin. And ghrelin will go up and it will act on our agouti-related peptide, neuropeptide Y neurons to send a signal further up and try and um, lead to an orexigenic signal. So we will stimulate appetite but also reduce our metabolism because if we're hungry, we don't want to be burning all of our energy, so we'll reduce metabolism. What also happens here is you're going to have inhibition of our what's it, alpha MSH because we don't want the opposite signal to be sent through. So you get this neuron inhibiting here as well as up here. Conversely, with um, insulin and leptin, which is you've just had a really good meal and your fat is happy, it's going to release some leptin and insulin will be released as well. It's going to act on our POMC cart neurons to then send the signal up here and result in um, an anorexigenic signal. So it will reduce the appetite because we're full, but it will then start to increase your metabolism. And similarly as well, this one will um, inhibit this guy. So you don't have the signal going at the same time. I think someone said it. Yeah. And Mita? So I'll just be going through a few more organs now, um, you know, the better part of the presentation. Um, <laughs> um, so the spleen, don't really have to know much about the spleen. Um, we've kind of um, gone through most of this stuff already, so just knowing that the splenic artery, one of the um, main three branches from the celiac trunk, it's got a very tortuous path, tortuous, big bug, buzzword to the splenic artery. Um, it's winding to the spleen. Um, and the splenic vein, um, Whitney's already gone through all that stuff. Just knowing its anatomy, it's in your left upper quadrant, roughly behind 9th to 11th ribs. Um, so just knowing where that is there. Um, kind of near the pancreatic um, tail there, as you can see. Um, and the splenic flexure of the large colon. Um, it's a secondary lymphatic organ, so it's going to be recycling and destroying your old and um, damaged red blood cells. It's very prone to trauma. So a common story is if you've got like a footy player or a rugby player that's fallen on their left hand side, you know, they've fallen on someone's boot or something, <laughs> something sharp, um, and they've ruptured their spleen, so that's going to have to result in a splenectomy. Um, and just some connections, so it's connected to the stomach, which is also on your left hand side by the gastrosplenic ligament, and to the left kidney by the splenorenal ligament. Um, so the pancreas. Um, this boy here. Um, so a couple of main parts. So you've got the head and then the uncinate process, which is just tucked in here. Sometimes isn't mentioned, like in this diagram. Um, you've got the neck, body, and tail. Um, good thing to note is that the pancreas, most of it, is secondarily retroperitoneal, 
whereas the tail is the only part that is intraperitoneal. So could definitely be a question on that. Um, and some important relations to the arteries. So the superior mesenteric artery and vein kind of runs here in between the pancreatic head and uncinate process just in there. Um, and then you've got the splenic vein and the inferior mesenteric vein, which isn't meant to be so tortuous, um, just joining posterior to the pancreas. Um, and just looking through a section of the pancreas, just knowing that you've got the main pancreatic duct coming through here, which joins the common bile duct at the ampulla of vata, which opens into the um, second part of the duodenum at the duodenal papilla. So all of those are words that will pop up on your exam um, and should know, and there's a lot of clinical relevance there, which we'll go through. Um, and again, knowing that the superior mesenteric vessels just lie posterior to the pancreas. Um, so just some physiology and histology. Um, do you guys get a lot of histology? Yes? Cool. Um, so <laughs> uh, in the centre here, you're going to have your eyelets of Langerhans, and then surrounding that, you're going to have your asini, or however you like to say it. Um, so the asini, your exocrine portion that will be associated with the ducts, the eyelets will be closely associated with blood vessels because that's the endocrine portion. Um, and this type of picture is very, very, very likely to pop up on your exam. You just have to know which is which. So just these little blobs here are the eyelets and everything else is the asini. Um, so yeah, you probably all know this already, but the most common endocrine secretion that you'll have is your insulin from your beta cells. Um, glucagon from your alpha cells is less likely, or less, sorry, numerous, and somatostatin from your delta cells, don't even worry about that one. Um, and then the exocrine secretions, you're going to have bicarbonate, which is released from the ductal cells, so the ducts, and then um, your digestive enzymes from the asini, so just these little balls on the end, um, so don't get confused as to where they're released from. Um, pancreatic secretions, so you've got inactive and active enzymes. So your inactive ones are termed zymogens, main one being trypsinogen. So trypsinogen will be released from the asini, travel through the ductal system, move into the um, duodenum, where it will be um, activated by the membrane-bound enterokinase, so very important to know that, which will cleave it into trypsin, and then trypsin can kind of activate itself more, and trypsin will then go on to activate the rest of the inactive enzymes. So clinical relevance, pancreatitis is um, a very big one that will definitely pop up again on your exams. So typical stories that you've got an epigastric pain or kind of pain up here that radiates to the back, remembering that it's a um, secondarily retroperitoneal organ. So you're gonna have pain radiating to your back. Um, it's relieved by sitting forward. Again, a very big buzzword. And you'll have associated nausea, vomiting, and steatorrhea. Um, I get smashed is something I'm sure all of you have heard of before. So these are um, the causes of pancreatitis and it's very good because the first few are the main causes of pancreatitis and the only ones I'll really worry about. So gallstones and alcohol will cause greater than 90% of all pancreatitis that you'll ever see. Um, so definitely don't forget those two. And just mainly if you're looking at investigations, you'll get a raise in your lipase and amylase. So that's all you have to know about pancreatitis. And then the only thing I'd know about pancreatic cancer or head of pancreatic cancer is that it's painless jaundice. That's all you need to know. Moving on to the liver, so just some functions for you all to look through. I'm sure you all know them. Um, so structure and function of the liver. Up in your right hypochondrium, moves into the epigastrium and some of it extends into your left hypochondrium underneath the diaphragm. It's an intraperitoneal organ. Um, but the only part that isn't covered by anything is just the bare area, just up there, which is in direct contact with your diaphragm. So you can split the liver up into functional lobes um, and anatomical lobes. So I'll go through those in a sec. Um, and I guess the main thing to know that, again, is always a question, is the porta hepatis, um, as Lucy mentioned before. So at the posterior part of the liver, you can see these three here. So you've got the um, hepatic portal vein, hepatic artery and bile duct all running together. So don't forget that. Ooh. <laughs> um, so the anatomical lobes, there are four. So if you're looking anteriorly, you can see there's right and left split by the falciform ligament. Um, and then if you're looking posteriorly, you've got the quadrate lobe um, and the chordate lobe. 
so the chordate superior and the quadrate inferior. Um, and you've just got some ligaments at the top, so the coronary ligaments and the left and right triangular ligaments connecting the, di the liver to the diaphragm superiorly. Um, there's also some physiological or functional loads. I don't think this is very high yield at all. Not sure if you guys have actually even been taught this. Yes, cool, go through it then. Um, so there's eight physiological loads, um, and again, it's split into left and right. Um, so I guess the main thing to know with this is that the hepatic veins, so these ones here, run vertically between the lobes, and then the portal triads will run horizontally between the lobes. That's all I would know. So looking more so at the microstructure and histology, so the functional unit of the liver is the lobule. So there's little hexagons here. In the center of each lobule, you'll have a central vein, and then kind of at the corners is where you'll find your little portal triads. Um, so yeah, your portal triads being the portal vein, bile duct, and hepatic arteriole. Your portal vein um, and hepatic arteriole will form the sinusoid, where the blood will mix. Lining these sinusoids, you have Kupfer cells, which are the liver macrophages. And then in the space of DISI, just outside of the sinusoid, you have your stelate cells, so storing vitamin A and fat. But the main function of them, or not function, but function kind of clinical relevance, um, is that they will be the things that are causing the scarring and fibrosis in cirrhosis. So that could definitely be a question. Um, so yeah, just being very familiar with this type of histological slide because this and the um, pancreatic one, very, very likely to come up. Um, so portal hypertension, is kind of already gone through this, but just to reiterate, because it's very high yield, um, is that when you have cirrhosis of the liver, so a lot of congestion, scarring, blood just has to flow back. Um, and in the portal vein and all of its kind of tributaries, there is no um, valves. So all the blood is just going to flow right back. Um, so that's going to lead to esophageal varices, could put medusae, so all these like big distended veins around your um, belly button, so something that you look for in your gastrointestinal exam. Um, hemorrhoids, splenomegaly, and in severe cases, you'll get ascites, so an enormous belly. Um, and ruptured varices are very, very dangerous. It's a medical emergency um, and can lead to very dangerous bleeding and, yeah, not very good outcome. Nuffle D, I'm sure you've all heard of. So it's just a spectrum. Um, so things like diabetes and insulin resistance is the main cause of this. You just get fat accumulation in your liver. So the first step will be non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, at this stage, it's completely reversible. If you continue on with your kind of poor diet or perhaps uncontrolled diabetes, that progresses to NASH. So it's fat plus inflammatory cells now. Um, at this stage, again, it's still reversible, albeit a little bit harder. Um, if that progresses though, you'll progress to cirrhosis where it then becomes irreversible. So knowing the points where it is reversible and irreversible is very important. Um, and if you're looking at an alcohol, alcoholic fatty liver disease as well, if you're looking at the histology of it, there's actually no difference. So it's just based on what the cause is. Um, and cirrhosis in few instances can um, cause hepatic carcinoma. So jaundice, something that's very likely again to come up, is the buildup of your bilirubin. Um, so looking at the pathway, so when you have your breakdown of your hemoglobin, it's going to break into the heme and the globin parts. The heme part is what's going to be producing your bilirubin. So it will firstly be unconjugated, and because it's unconjugated, it needs to travel with albumin because it's not soluble. Um, so as it travels into the liver, it gets conjugated by this enzyme here, the UDP glucuronal transferase, um, and then it becomes conjugated, um, and the conjugated bilirubin is now soluble. So it then passes into your bile ducts and into your small intestine, where almost all of it is converted to urobilinogen by the, some of the bacteria in there, and then to stercobilin, and that's what makes your poo brown. Um, and then about 10% of it, so not a lot, goes through the portal vein, and then um, through the kidneys because it is soluble. So you should never see conjugated bilirubin um, traveling in your blood. There's, something's wrong if you see that. Um, and I guess when you're looking at bilirubin, it needs to be twice its normal amount to be clinical, 
clinically relevant. So if it's slightly elevated, you won't be jaundiced. So if you can split up jaundice into pre, intra and post hepatic causes, it's a really great way of thinking about it. Um, and a good way um, to think of it is if, if it's pre-hepatic cause of your jaundice, it will be unconjugated bilirubin that's increased. If it's an intrahepatic cause, it will be mixed because you've got some liver damage. Um, so it means you might be able to conjugate some, might not be able to conjugate all of it, so you'll have a mix. Um, and post-hepatic, you'll have conjugated um, bilirubin because you've probably got some obstruction in the bile duct, so your liver's working fine, it's just that it can't really get out anywhere. Um, yeah, have a read through that, but that's pretty much all I would know, that the unconjugated mixed and conjugated pictures of each. And just some good pictures to go through that if you're more of a visual learner. So the gallbladder, um, so it's just some key parts, so the neck, body and fundus. And then this little out pouching here, which is the infundibulum or Hartman's pouch, Clinical, clinically relevant because that's where your gallstones are most likely to get stuck. Um, storage of bile and just knowing the bile duct free. So you've got your cystic duct, which joins the common hepatic duct and forms your common bile duct, which will then join your pancreatic duct. Um, and release of bile from the bile duct is mainly stimulated by cholecystokinin. Um, and again, that's something you guys can go through in your own time just for the sake of time. Um, so clinical relevance, so a lot of slightly confusing terms that took me bloody forever to learn and I still have trouble with. Um, so cholecystitis is inflammation of your gallbladder um, and a typical sign that you'll have is a positive Murphy sign. Um, and that will nine times out of 10 re require a cholecystectomy. Um, with cholecystitis, however, you probably won't have jaundice. Um, so if you see a positive Murphy sign on its own, it's cholecystitis. Um, ascending cholangitis is inflammation of your biliary tree. So it's like you've got a stone lodged somewhere and bile has just kind of stopped in its tract. So stasis is the basis for infection. Um, it's a good thing to know. Um, and so there's a classic triad, jaundice, right upper quadrant pain and a fever. If you see any of these three things, it's ascending cholangitis, again, very likely to come up. Um, cholelithiasis is a stone in the gallbladder and cholelithiasis is a stone in the biliary tree. So don't get confused between all those terms. Um, looking at LFTs, have you guys gone through LFTs before? Yep, cool. Um, so knowing that the liver enzymes, these ones here, um, which aren't actually markers of liver function, they're of liver damage. The actual markers of function of the liver is your albumin, your INR, and your bilirubin. So a good way to just split it up is your ALT and your AST will be your hepatic picture, your GGT and ALP will be your um, cholestatic picture. So just good to differentiate there. Um, ALT is more specific for the liver, so think L liver because um, ASTs produce some other places as well. If you've got a really, really, really sharp increase in your ALT, it's likely to be some very acute damage, so like acute hepatitis or an acute paracetamol overdose is a very common thing that they like to ask. If for some reason your AST is greater than your ALT, think stubbies over liver, so it's an alcoholic cause. Um, and cholestatic picture, I guess, a stone in the duct or something will cause a release in um, both GGT and ALP. ALP alone, um, I think like P for Paget's, I associate it with bone. So I think if you've got an ALP increase on its own and something is going on with the bone, um, and GGT alone is alcohol. Um, I've kind of gone through this already, so I might just skip past this one here. Um, so I'll move on to Lucy now. Okay, so layers of the gastrointestinal tract. We have um, four layers. Firstly, the mucosa, which is made up of your epithelium. Um, important to note that we don't have any blood vessels in the epithelium. So if you have like a carcinoma that's arise in the epithelium, we know that it hasn't penetrated through the um, basement membrane. But because you have no blood vessels, there's no potential for metastasis of that cancer. Um, the lamina propria and the muscularis mucosa. Um, the submucosa, it's important to know that this is where your kind of nerves begin. Um, and then we have more nerves in the muscularis pro 
appropria between the inner circular and the outer longitudinal layers. And then you have the adventitia and the serosa, which are essentially the same thing. It just depends if the organ is retroperitoneal or intraperitoneal. So the duodenum, as Jadams would say, um, we have four parts. Clinical relevance is, um, first part is intraperitoneal, um, and it's where we have ulceration um, in peptic ulcer disease. Part two is important because we have um, the foregut becoming the midgut, and we also have the major duodenal pillar, um, which is where we have our secretions from the pancreas and from the bile duct entering the, entering the duodenum. Sorry, I love it. <laughs> um, important parts of, or in functions of um, the duodenum is the chemical digestion of chyme, um, absorption of iron. You might, guys might have a good way to remember what gets absorbed where. It's a bit explicit for, I'll turn the video off and then I'll tell you a bit later. But um, this is the I part of I, F, bitches. So iron folate, B12 for duodenum, ileum, sorry, duodenum, jejunum, ileum. That's like just a good way to remember your different um, things that get absorbed. Cool. Um, and it's the part that's most affected in celiac disease. So just thinking that's where your, all your stomach contacts are going to empty first. So that's where you're going to have irritation of your, um, your GI tract. So histology of the duodenum. Just think Brunner's glands. These are really specific to the duodenum. They're nowhere else in the gastrointestinal tract. And they're going to secrete some alkali alkaline mucus, which is going to neutralize the really acidic kind that's coming out of the stomach. Um, and it also creates this um, environment that's really healthy for the pancreatic enzymes to do their thing. Um, and important to know that there's no plique circularis, which are in the jejunum. So jejunum, it's kind of, well, it's most important for the absorption of nutrients, but we know that folate is also <laughs> particularly important. Um, there's heaps of cells, so that's a really good diagram just here to know. Um, I won't go through it, but just knowing that there are these big kind of intestinal crypts, and that's where you're going to find all your different cells. Um, so we have no Brunner's glands, they were in the duodenum, and we have no pious patches, which are in the ileum. So they're just some fun pictures to look at when you have time, if you have time. Um, and then the ileum, so B12, and also bile salts um, I get absorbed in particularly the terminal ileum. So the clinical relevance of this is the terminal ileum is most affected in Crohn's disease, and Crohn's disease I'll cover very soon. Um, so if we don't have any absorption of um, bile salts, we don't have, we need bile salts for the absorption of fat. So no bile salts, no fat absorption. You get like steatorrhea because the fat remains in the, the gastric contents. Um, you have anemia because we need our vitamin B12 to make our red blood cells. Um, and histology pious patches is the lymphoid tissue that is the massive buzzword for the ileum. Don't worry too much about this. I just thought I'd pop it in because it looks really special. And again, just for revision later. So the enteric nervous system, um, just knowing that it kind of works with the autonomic nervous system, which was that video that I kind of popped up earlier, um, it can function, um, the gastrointestinal system can function without it, but it also just kind of influences what's going on. So that was in your myenteric plexus, which is found between your inner longitudinal, inner circular and outer longitudinal layers of your um, muscularis propria. Um, and just kind of knowing your excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters is, is important for that one. So sorry, I didn't really get to go over that much, but this is also like a very lame, but also like quite informative picture. So, um, Did you want to go through this, Alex? I think Alex is a bit more confident with this, so <laughs> you go for it. Um, very quick, so just some movement within the small intestine. You've got two main things, so your segmenting contractions, they can be anything in this picture here, so like regularly spaced, isolated, whatever, just it's helping just kind of mixing everything up um, so they can go kind of forwards and backwards just to mix all the chyme together and like push it into the intestinal wall to help absorption. Um, and then once your segmenting contractions are over, they get replaced by the MMCs, so migrating myoelectric complexes. So after most of the meal, meal is absorbed, you'll get these and it's just kind of like the housekeeping of the gastrointestinal system. Um, 
So it's these constant peristaltic activity um, that begins at the lower part of the stomach and just kind of moves through it. So it's like this slow wave that moves through the stomach and just moves about um, 60 centimetres. And so when that one's done, the next one will start slightly downstream from when the first one started. So to keep everything moving. Um, so it kind of helps prevent like bacterial overgrowth because stasis is the basis of infection. So if you have any blockages or anything, that's when you get infections. Um, and then once again, once you have meals entering the stomach, again, that's when they will stop and then the segmenting contractions will take over. As you were. <laughs> okay. So fat absorption, um, I won't cover it super comprehensively, but just knowing that you need bile salts, um, which are absorbed in the terminal ileum, as we said before, for digestion or absorption of your fats. Um, so once you take in your, um, once you ingest your fats, sorry, we need to break them down so that they can be absorbed into the enterocytes and um, into the kind of lymphatic system. So we have a few different um, factors working to do that. We have the bile salts, we have some pancreatic secretions, so pancreatic lipase. Um, and so they're going to fi form these little emulsification droplets that get further broken down into micelles. So this is still in the gastrointestinal system. And then these micelles are acted upon by pancreatic lipase um, and to break them down into the like monoglyceride, glycerol kind of forms, which are absorbed across the enterocyte border. Um, so just knowing that they need to be in their individual kind of components to be absorbed into the enterocyte and then they form chylomicrons once they're inside the enterocyte and they're trans transported um, through the lymphatics as chylomicrons. So you can just remember chylomicrons is kind of like chyle, which is the contents of the lymphatic system. So the large intestine. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just going through kind of the um, structure and function, I guess you guys are all very well aware of the functions of the large intestine. Um, looking at the movement of the large intestine, so you've got haustral contractions, so when you've got um, gastrointestinal contents moving into the ileocecal valve, finally into your colon, that's when you'll get these haustral contractions, so activated by stretch is the main point to know there. So it's just these little contractions in the haustra that um, kind of help move everything along. Um, but the main one that you need to know of are the mass movements. Um, so, yep, they're really good. <laughs> um, have about three a day, if you're regular. Um, I'm not. So you have like these really, you didn't need to know that. Um, have these really long, sort of slow moving, but very, very powerful contractions that sweep from the cecum to the sigmoid. Um, and they're very, very large, so they're not just within the house row, they're all along the house row. Um, so when you have these mass, mass movements, you'll get a distal loss of house row due to these massive constrictions. Um, and then the main thing to know about them is they're facilitated by the gastrocolic and duodenal colic <laughs> reflexes. So when you have food coming to the stomach and the duodenum, your um, colon's just making way for new stuff. So it wants to get all the shit out of it, make room for new shit. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then defecation as well is a reflex. So once the mass movement gets everything into um, the rectum, you're going to get the afferent stretch signals going to your spinal cord, and then the spinal reflex is moving back and just causing contraction. So um, you're going to have your parasympathetic nervous system activated here to get contraction of your rectum, but relaxation of your internal anal sphincter, and then just knowing that you have voluntary control over the external and also being done. Yeah. That's cool. So IBD, have you guys covered this at all? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to use a little story that Whitney told me about to remember our IBD. So with Crohn's disease, um, it's gum to bum. So that's a that's a good way to remember it. So it's going to affect or any like any part of your gastrointestinal system, which contrasts with ulcerative colitis, which starts in your rectum and moves proximally. But Whitney tells me that there's a little crow, so Crohn's disease, there's a little crow who likes to, you know how like crows don't like walk, they just like skip around. So it's gonna like skip along this cobblestone path, which is cobblestone lesions are a massive buzzword for um, Crohn's disease. Um, and the other one was like, 
he just comes across like this massive kind of rock on this cobblestone path and that rock is like a massive granuloma. So you have granulomas in Crohn's disease but you don't have granulomas in ulcerative colitis. So <laughs> I hope that helps. <laughs> um, as we said before, the terminal ileum is most affected in Crohn's disease and that can lead to your deficiency in vitamin B12, bile salts, so steatorrhea, um, and you have like really fatty, floaty poop is like a buzzword, particularly for OSCEs. Um, so you're gonna have umbilical to right iliac fossa pain because we know that the um, ileum is in your right iliac fossa and smoking is really bad for Crohn's disease. So just think of like the crow having a smoke as it skips along <laughs> the cobblestone path. <laughs> Um, and with Crohn's disease, because it is gum to bum, it can affect like multiple sites along the gastrointestinal tract. There's no point in performing surgery because if you do take out a section, there's still heaps of other sections that are affected. So this contrasts with Crohn's disease, which affects um, your terminal gastrointest gastrointestinal tract. So we can actually like perform a hemicolectomy, remove that section, and you can be cured of ulcerative colitis. Um, clinically, bloody diarrhea is um, a buzzword for ulcerative colitis. Just think it's most where you're going to do a poo as opposed to Crohn's disease. So that's, yeah, bloody diarrhea. And it's left iliac fossa pain, so on the other side, because that's where our sigmoid colon and rectum is. So, some lovely images for you. Um, we have three kind of types of blood. So we have hematochesia, which is this bright red frank kind of fresh blood and that suggests kind of lower gastrointestinal tract bleeding and that contrasts with melina which is really like dark tarry stools which is higher up in the gastro gastrointestinal tract. So apparently the major, major duodenal papilla which is in the second part of the duodenum, anything above that is melina and if anything below that is usually hematochesia. So, sorry guys. <laughs> um, causes uh, of the fresh blood, just think hemorrhoids because that's really low down, ulcerative colitis, diverticulitis, diverticular disease actually, not diverticulitis, um, and colorectal cancer, and then your kind of gastric pathologies result in melina. And then occult blood is blood that we can't actually see, so that's when we have um, so our bowel screening program, we're going to look for occult blood, so um, it's not visible to the naked eye, but you can detect it with the screening programs. Hemorrhoids, so we've kind of discussed these in the case of portal hypertension, so I won't cover them too much, but just knowing that um, you have internal hemorrhoids and external hemorrhoids, um, and they're defined um, in like relative to their position to the dentate line or pectinate line, which is this squiggly thing here. So above is internal, they are not painful, below are external, they are painful. And you can have a mixed picture as well, so you can have some that originate from above and below the dentate line. So, yeah, that's about time. So we've done a few slides on kind of microbes, pharmacology, clinical skills. Okay, we might go for like 10 more minutes if that's okay. Is that all right? If we go for like five, 10 more minutes? Yeah. Oh, like, our topic's like more important than everyone else's, so we get more time. Um, but don't stress too much about these, we just put some buzzwords for some fun learning down the track. Yes. Um, so I'm just going to talk very, very quickly about pharmacology and then some clinical skills words, so be short. Um, so I've just got some tables for all the main drugs for you, so just being aware of some of the main drugs. Um, so for peptic ulcers and gourd, you'll use anti secretory agents, so your PPIs will be your main ones just knowing they're all in the, there's also isomeprazole, omeprazole, pentoprazole, just knowing those. So it's going to be blocking that potassium um, hydrogen ADPase on the luminal side. Very, very effective first line treatment. Um, and just knowing that they've got some indications, so you will never be asked that, so don't worry. Um, the other one you can use is the histamine 2 receptor antagonist, so ranitidine. Um, and this is mainly useful for um, ulcers that aren't quite controlled by your PPIs or if it's um, a duodenal ulcer as well, because that's more for like the nocturnal acid secretion. I remember what Whitney said before with the, um, histamines more so for like that nocturnal acid secretion. Um, same ADRs as PPIs. Um, also for peptic ulcers, you have some adjuncts, so your cytoprotective agents. Um, so just things that kind of help protect your stomach. So sucralfate would probably be the main one. Just think it's um, viscous at an acidic pH, so it helps form this 
kind of adhesion over the ulcer base. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the main one to know there. And just knowing that you wouldn't give an antacid at the same time as this, because if you're going to give an antacid, that's going to increase the pH and it's going to decrease the effectivity of the sucralfate. Um, PG analogs, misoprostol, they're very, very effective in NSAID-related um, peptic ulcers because with NSAIDs you're blocking your prostaglandins. So pretty much this is just giving back your prostaglandins. Um, bismuth chelate will make your poo black and your tongue black. Um, and the antacids, just knowing the two main types, so the aluminium and magnesium types. Aluminium will cause constipation, magnesium will cause diarrhea. Knowing that, will you'll be fine. Um, peptic ulcers, so in the case of H. pylori infections, you'll give your triple therapy. Um, this is a very, very high yield topic. So you'll give a PPI, clarithromycin, which is a macrolide, and amoxicillin. But if you're allergic to penicillin, you'll give metronidazole. So that's the main treatment there for H. pylori. Um, in terms of constipation, there's a few types of laxatives, and I recall this being on every exam ever, so don't forget about them. So the bulk laxatives are kind of like your first line ones that you get from like the supermarket, like your Metamucil and Citrusel. I've never heard of Citrusel, but Metamucil. Um, so they're just poorly digested compounds which stain your gut, help retain um, water and just kind of stretch the gut a bit more and promote peristalsis. Um, so you can imagine you sometimes get bloating um, or even diarrhea. Um, your osmotic laxatives are kind of like a next step up. They're much, much more effective and you'll see them all the time in the hospital. So like your lactulose and Movicol, and as I mentioned before, magnesium sulfate. I think that was one of the antacids that caused diarrhea, so you can use it as a laxative. These um, cause water to move into the gut, so they are much more effective at causing um, a laxative effect. So you can sometimes get like cramps, it can be a little bit painful. Um, and then stimulant laxatives, Senna is the main one, which pretty much just increases peristalsis of your gut. Um, and you will always see Senna with Coloxal, a fecal softener. Um, every old person on the wards has this, so um, you'll see it everywhere. Um, and yeah, so Coloxal is just a fecal softener, will just reduce the surface tension. Diarrhea, there's only one main drug, Loperamide or Imodium, if you've heard of that before. So it's an opioid agonist within the gastrointestinal system. Um, so it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, which is good. Um, and mainly used for things like traveler's diarrhea. And just some very, very important notes, don't use it in someone with bacterial diarrhea, because if you're going to stop motility in their gastrointestinal system, you're just going to keep the bacteria in their gut. Um, and do not use in patients with acute um, inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's or ulcer ulcerative colitis. Again, because you're going to be stopping the movement and you're going to increase their risk of either like perforation, fistula, um, or toxic megacolon in the case of ulcerative colitis. Um, and so, just the last one, so vomiting. Um, two main ones, so the dopamine 2 receptor antagonists, which is your metoclopramide, blocking dopamine 2 type receptors within the chemoreceptor trigger zone in the area per streamer. This is very, very, very high yield. Um, and on Dancitron, which will block your 5-HT3, so the serotonin receptors, in the same area. Um, oh, also, with metoclopramide, just it's contraindicating Parkinson's because they don't have enough dopamine already, so don't block more. Um, histamine 1 receptor type antagonists, um, these are mainly used in like motion sickness. So this is your promethazine, which is phenergan. I'm sure some of you here have had that before. Um, and it's mainly in the vestibular nuclei. So I think like balance, motion sickness, stuff like that. And the antimuscarinics are the same. And don't even bother about this one. Um, so clinical skills, we've just got some tables about all the signs that you look for in your exams. So this one and that one. Um, so just knowing some really key signs. I guess some key things, key things never to forget are things like clubbing. Um, it's in a lot of exams, but just forgetting that things like cirrhosis can cause it and a lot of patients will have it. Um, and alcoholism causes a lot of really, really good signs like Dupchen's contracture, um, liver failure, you've got a flap, that's in a lot of exams as well, so don't forget it. Um, well, and just being aware of the signs, so Murphy's sign for like cholecystitis, Rovsing sign for appendicitis, so when you push on the left-hand side, it causes pain in your right-hand side, um, and McBurney's point for where the appendix is. 
Um, cool. So that's it. Did you guys want to go through some questions, or do you just want to fuck off and have lunch? <laughs> Yeah, lunch, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <Go have lunch. laughs> yeah. um, also, if you guys have any questions or anything, just like add us on Facebook. We're happy to take questions as well. So, yeah. That's all right. Um, yeah. Um, all right. So there's food outside there in boxes so they need to get take, taken out of boxes. Um, also, comedian and well-being have um, like little goodie bags for everyone. So, so make sure to grab your goodie bag of stuff before you have lunch. All right, thanks.